Today, in part five of our series, Stories to be Shaped by, the teaching is from the parable of the rich fool, as told by Luke in chapter 12. Can you relate to how the rich man saw life? Have you walked the way of a fool? So how do we become rich toward God? Here's Pastor Seth. Around the turn of the 1900s, there was the legend of Pancho Villa. Pancho Villa had a small band of banditos that would cross the Rio Grande in Texas and rob from the banks and some of the small towns and villages just, just inside the Rio Grande border of Texas. The uh, posses that tried to uh, catch him uh, were not allowed to cross the Rio Grande to go into Mexico, and so finally the local sheriffs uh, contacted the Texas Rangers, the Texas Rangers uh, contacted the federal agents, and finally a group of 25 U.S. Marshals were sent to South Texas to track down Pancho Villa the next time that he made it into the U.S. to rob a bank. Well, he robbed the bank and his men took off back into what they thought was the safety of Mexico, and the U.S. Uh, Marshals followed them right into Mexico, and uh, Pancho Villa tried to elude the, the Marshals he thought he had, and he would finally hold up in his hometown, little cantina, kind of little village, uh, where he was inside with uh, his five men. The U.S. Marshals came and surrounded the, the little cantina, had the back door and the front door closed, closed off. And the, the, main, the main U.S. Marshal went in and went up to Pancho V, would put a gun to his head and said, we're from the U.S. federal government. We're here to collect the money that you stole from the banks. You better tell us where the money is or we're going to kill you and your banditos in cold blood. Pancho Villa looked around, realized he was hopelessly outnumbered, and, uh, and he started to tell the marshal where the money was, but he only spoke Spanish, and the U.S. marshal had forgot to bring an interpreter. He called out to anybody else, was there anybody that spoke English? And one little guy in the very back of the cantina said, Si, senor. Brought him up, and he said, You tell Pancho Villa that if he doesn't tell us where all the gold is from the money he stole from the banks, they were going to take him and his men out back and shoot him in cold blood. The little interpreter turned to Pancho Villa and explained exactly what the U.S. Marshal had said, word for word. Pancho Villa looked around again and realized the hopeless situation, and he, he said to the interpreter, tell the U.S. Marshal to go to the, to the middle of the town where the well is, to count down ten bricks. You'll find a brick inside the well that has a big X on it. Pull that brick out, and inside you will find all of the gold we stole from the banks. The little interpreter turned to the U.S. Marshal, and he said, Marshal, Pancho say he very brave man, not afraid to die. <laughs> I love that story, because in some ways it illustrates something of our human nature. The desire for greed is never-ending, and it's seen in every aspect of our social and economic condition, whether from the richest or to the poorest. Michael Gill, at age 53, seemed to have everything uh, rolling just like he wanted to. Life was at the top of his game, or so he thought. Uh, he had a lovely wife, an expensive home, making $160,000 a year job as an advertising executive at age 53. At age 63, he was unemployed, divorced, nearly broke, and his surgeon, his doctor, had just told him that he had a slow-growing brain tumor. He'd been out of work long enough that he was afraid now of uh, being without health insurance, which he needed desperately because of his cancer, and he was getting to the place where he needed a paycheck, any kind of paycheck, and he humbled himself to take a job, entry-level job at Starbucks. He found out that he loved the work. Later on, he was uh, asked about what he'd learned there, and he said, during my, uh, all my adult life, I had defined myself by my career, and I defined myself by my social status. I was affluent. I was a Yale grad, an ad executive, and when I was let go of my position, I thought the solution would be to find another ad exec job somewhere or to start my own ad consulting business. That's how I define myself. 
and all that was finally lost. I realized I spent most of my adult life chasing bigger paychecks, flashier job titles, and loftier possessions. And it's at Starbucks it finally struck me that I would probably never have those things again. Not the big titles, not the big flashy possessions, and yet he realized I've never been happier in my entire life. One of the lessons that he said he learned was what he calls trust the universe. Of course, as Christians, we would say something quite different. But uh, he said, I thought of myself as the master of, of my universe when I was young and successful. He re and he said, I realize that no person is the master of the universe. And it's foolish even to aspire to be one. Trying to master the universe means struggling against the tide of events, which rarely works. When the universe pushed me out of the executive suite, I tried to take charge and reclaim my life as I had previously. And I did not find happiness again until I stopped fighting the tide and started swimming with it to see where it led. Michael Gates Gill, former creative director at J. Walter Thompson Advertising, currently a barista at Starbucks in Bronxville, New York. Our parable for, the, for today is what's called the parable of the rich fool. The setting for the parable is a, is a throng of people around Jesus. One of these kind of mob scenes where everybody's trying to get closer uh, to hear what he's saying or to touch the hem of his garment. Uh, and he's been teaching about some big subjects, about heaven and hell and the unpardonable sin and the wonder of forgiveness that God provides. And it's out of that context of, of teaching the, the multitudes that our uh, story unfolds. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Now, this fellow obviously had a concern that he thought was important enough to interrupt Jesus Christ teaching thousands of people. To try to put this in perspective, imagine the, that you're at Anaheim Stadium and uh, you're, you're attending a Greg Laurie crusade. And in the middle of this crusade, while, while Greg is talking about important issues, you see a guy walk down, walk down on the field, across the grass, up onto the podium, and over to the microphone and tell Greg, Greg, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. What would you think of that guy? The audacity? How could a fellow be that self-centered that with thousands of people around, he would think this was, this was an important thing to, uh, to break into and interrupt? Jesus responds this way, man, who appointed me a judge or an arbiter between you? The idea is simply is something like this. You're dealing with something that you think is one of the most important issues in your life, and you are sadly off base. And then Jesus turns to the crowd and uses what just happened as a teaching tool. He said to them, verse 15, watch out. Here's a warning. Be on your guard, he says. A second warning against all kinds of greed. A man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. Now, when we in America think about greed, we always think about the people who are greedy that have more money than we do. We were any, hardly anybody ever sees themselves as greedy. And yet, you'll notice in the text that Jesus says all kinds of greed meaning there's different kinds of greed than just money or just possessions. And the idea of the word greed there and many kinds of greed is simply the words, I need more. I need more. Whatever that more is, whether it's money or possessions or something in relationship, safety, security, whatever it is you happen to think, is what pro provides you real life. I need more of that is what is greed. And Jesus said, be on the alert against all kinds of greed. Then he says, a man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. 
And when Jesus uses the word life, most of the time he's not talking about our physical life, but he's talking about what that elusive it that we're all looking for, that thing which fills us and provides a certain sense of satisfaction or blessedness or contentment. Not going to happen in the abundance of his possessions. Here in this little thing, we are warned, I think, about three different, three different things that uh, are easy for us to, to get into. The first is not recognizing our self-centeredness, like this man. He probably had no idea he was as self-centered as he could be. And I often think that's certainly true about us. The second thing is materialism, the belief that, that the material world has something uh, of which can fill my interior soul. Something out there that I can see can fill something inside that I can't see. That won't work. And third, hedonism. The idea that if I seek what I most desire, that will fill me. It always fills us for a little bit, but it's not the ultimate answer to life. Now, it's at this point that Jesus decides to tell a parable, not just to the man, but to all the people. Luke 12, 16. He told them this parable. The ground of a certain man produced a good crop. Now, if you're a farmer and you have a good crop, that's good news. If you're a businessman and you have good sales or salesman and you have good sales for the year, that's good stuff. We're happy about that. Nothing wrong with that. But when that happens... There are really two questions to ask. What's the first thing that you think? And what's the first thing that you're going to do? What's the first thing that you're going to think? What's the first thing you're going to do? And the reason why those are such important questions is that they expose what are my real priorities and my real purpose. Here's what he thought. He thought to himself. Here's his first thought. What shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Now, if you're in business, that's a problem. If, you, if, if suddenly you bring home triplets from the, hot, from the hospital to home, and you need more space in your home, that's a problem that needs a solution. But is that the first thought? Is that a good first thought? What shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. That's his first thought. What's his first action? This is what I'll do, verse 18. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones, and there I will store all my grain and my goods. What does he neglect to think, and what does he neglect to do? There's nothing here of a thought of, of thankfulness to God or giving praise to God or thanking God, falling on his knees giving testimony to others about the blessedness of God. No sense of humility in his thoughts. Those are all at least secondary thoughts. The first thought was, what am I going to do to get more? What does he do? What could he have done? What could action could he have done differently? The first thing he could have done is he could have gone down to the temple, a sanctuary, and tithed a portion of the crops back to God. Or he could have thought of some people in his, where he lived that could have used some money or could use some of the grain that he was bringing in. But that wasn't what his first action was. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones. There I will store all my grains and my goods. Nothing wrong with building bigger barns. But there's something terribly wrong if that's your first thought and your first action step. It exposes what's really, really, really important inside. Verse 19, he says, I'll say to myself, you have plenty of good things laid up for many years. Take life easy, drink, and be merry. His first thought was about himself and how to solve his business problem, how to get more. His first action was to build bigger barns in order to get more. His highest priority was security, as we see in this verse, you have plenty of good things laid up for many years, or what we can say is his imagined security. As the parable is going to show us, his security didn't last very long. Highest priority was security. His highest purpose was ease and pleasure. 
what we might call, what our, what our culture calls the good life. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. That's the first part of the parable. I'm sure the man could identify with it. And I'm sure a lot of people that were listening could identify with it. And there's probably ways that you and I identify with it too. It exposes what's most important in us. A lot of the parables, as we've seen, have a twist to them. And here's the biggest twist in this parable. But God said to him, you fool. You fool. This very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This very night your life will be demanded from you. When people use the word fool usually, we usually use the word from one person to another in a pejorative sense. As a put down or as a statement of anger, you fool. But in the Old Testament, the word fool is a technical term. And that's the one that, Je that, God, that Jesus is using here in the words of God to the man in the parable. The fool in the Old Testament is the person who, and you can fill in in your outline here, is the person who lives as if God has not spoken. Now, I'm not saying that the fool is somebody who doesn't believe that God exists or that even God hasn't written things down in the Bible, but that what he has spoken is really not all that serious to take into account. If there's something different that I want to take into account, that's okay. That's how the fool thinks. Let me give you an example. Have you ever heard somebody say when, when, when they know that they're doing something they shouldn't be doing? doing, they say, well, wouldn't God want me to be happy? Or they justify something by saying, well, what I'm doing isn't hurting anybody. This is the fool. He lives as if God has not spoken. Secondly, he lives as if God does not exist. Again, I'm not saying that he's an atheist or he doesn't believe that God does exist. He's just living as if he didn't exist. You hear this in the often famous words that everybody knows. What happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. He lives as if God does not exist. Or the person that says, well, nobody will know what I, what I did. Lives as if God does not exist. And his life centers around filling himself first. First, that what matters to him most is what's first. What, what he thinks fulfills him most is what's first. And anything that has to do with God comes in second. And not only is it first, but he deserves it. That's how a fool thinks. That's how a fool looks at his life. And then verse 21, Jesus says, This is how it will be with anyone who stores up things for himself but is not rich towards God. God. This is how it will be. Anyone who stores up things for himself is not rich toward God. Now, what is the, this is how it will be. There are four things of, of how it will be for this person. Number one, there's coming a day when all that you have worked for is suddenly Man stands naked now with nothing in his debt. Suddenly, the future that he imagined of ease and happiness and merriment, gone. Gone. He will never have one more moment of ease. No, not one more moment of merriness, merriment. Not one more moment of happiness. Not one more moment of sitting back and enjoying the good life. This is how it will be. How? He will look at all the time that he spent gathering the more as suddenly utterly ridiculous. What did I do with my life? He would look back.
back and wonder. And the fourth thing, this is how it will be. Jesus says here in, the, in this verse, with anyone who stores up things for himself but is not rich toward God, suddenly the man in the parable who's standing there naked with nothing, wondering what he did with his life, the only question that's going to matter at that point for that man is, was I rich toward God? That's it. And that question will haunt this man for all eternity. Here's the man who was not rich toward God. He gave himself to what mattered least. And the one who's rich toward God is one who gives himself to what matters most. The one who is rich toward himself, the effect on him was to take nothing into the next world. And the effect of the man who's rich towards God is to take everything with which he invested in the kingdom of heaven into the future to enjoy for all eternity. Rich toward himself or rich toward God? There are three things that strike me when I think about being rich toward God, and they're, they're in your handout. We become rich toward God by living for the purposes of God in three ways. First of all, as our highest priority. This was exposed in the man with a thing he thought first and he did first, not his highest priority. Are the things of God my highest priority as I live my life? Secondly, we're rich toward God by allowing our lives to be used in advancing God's purposes in others. As a church, we are not the holy huddle. We are not just folks that come here and enjoy each other's company on Sunday and enjoy each other's company in a life group and in some of our activities. But we are people who care about the people who aren't here. And our life is used in loving them and reaching out to them and being a part of their lives. Number three, we are rich toward God, living for the purposes of God, accomplished through the investments that we make of our time, our money, and our relationships. The investments of our time, our money, and our relationships. In contrast to uh, the man in the parable, and in contrast to our own times, Harry Truman was, uh, became president when uh, Franklin Roosevelt uh, died, suddenly during World War II. Uh, when Harry Truman left the White House in January of 1952, uh, because uh, Eisenhower came in to become the new president, he and Bess drove home, not in the presidential motorcade, not in a presidential limo. They weren't taken home by Air Force One. Harry and Bess got in their family car and had a road trip from Washington, D.C. back to Independence, Missouri. At the end of his life, the only asset that Harry Truman had was the house that he had grown up in. Imagine that today with politicians. His wife had inherited a house from their mother and father that they had lived in uh, when she was growing up. In 1952, there was no presidential pension at that time. The only money that he had coming in was his army pension, which was a little over $13,000 a year. And when Congress found out later on that he was buying his own stationery and stamps and, and licking them to send out letters, <coughs> Congress voted to extend his uh, poten uh, pension to $25,000 a year. Imagine you were, used to be the President of the United States, and you're living pension to pension, month to month on your pension. Now, some of the big U.S. corporations came to Harry, offered him big positions, <coughs> big salaries, and this is what he said in declining every one. He said, you don't want me. You want the office of the president. And that 
does not belong to me. It belongs to the American people, and that is not for sale. On May 6, 1971, Congress wanted to vote him <coughs> the Medal of Honor to give on his 87th birthday. He wrote a letter back, said, I don't consider, refused to accept it, I don't consider that I have done anything which should be the reason for any award, congressional or otherwise. <coughs> As a post-president, he paid for all of his own travel expenses and food. He said, my choices in life, as he looked back on his, as an old man looking back on his life, he said, my choices in life were either to be a piano player in a whorehouse or a politician. And to tell the truth, there's hardly any difference. As you think about the parable of the rich fool, what strikes you? What are your first thoughts when your ship comes in? What are the first, what's the first thing that comes to mind that you're going to do? How much of the rich fool are you? Let's pray together. Father, you've given us this parable as a way of searching our hearts about what is most important in our lives, about our real purpose and our real priorities, our real beliefs about what's most important in life, our thoughts about what will fill us and satisfy us, and how easy it is to live for this world at the virtual exclusion of the next. Please rescue us from being foolish in the same way this man in the parable was and the rich man who interrupted Jesus. And help us to be a people who are rich toward you. We at Pacific Church of Irvine invite you to join us every Sunday at 9.30. You can also visit our website at pacificchurch.com.